I'm going to show you a quick little test that we use as a screen uh, in populations where the uh, frequency of dementia is relatively low. It's not a toy, and I'm not recommending that you use it, but this just gives you an example of how we would screen uh, for cognitive impairment. It's a simple test called the MINICOG. We ask the patient uh, to repeat three words, apple, table, penny, and to memorize them. Then we ask them to draw a clock. Draw the face of a clock, put the hands in so that a child can read it, and make them say 145. So they can draw the circle. Usually they put in the 12, 3, 6, and 9 in that order, and then the other numbers. The hour hand is shorter uh, than the minute hand, the time is correct. If all of those are correct, and you can recall all three of those words, there's a 98% probability that there are no cognitive deficits. Now, that doesn't mean if you can't do this that you have dementia. It might mean you didn't get enough sleep last night or you had, had a martini. There could be a number of reasons, and further testing would be indicated. Here's an example of some of the clocks that I've seen from patients that appeared perfectly normal. One last thought, <clears throat> competence and capacity. What's the difference? We use, tend to use these terms interchangeably, but they're different. Think of competence as a legal term and capacity more as a healthcare term. Capacity is the ability to understand the benefits and risk of a treatment plan or of an investment, for instance. It's determined by healthcare practitioners, and it applies to a specific decision, whether it's a healthcare condition or, gee, I want to buy a dress or, gee, I want to buy a new house. Courts only get involved when this process is challenged. Now, competence is a legal status. People over age 18 are automatically considered competent. We might question that since we know that executive function is delayed. Healthcare practitioners do not make the decision about competence. Only the court can declare a person incompetent. And if they are incompetent, a court must appoint a guardian or conservator. And that's the process. So we should report abuse when we suspect it the Adult Protective Services in Texas is the agency that we call. New referrals, you can call this 800 number. We should also report this to the victim's bank and to the police department. We can't be silent about it. We need to be more alert about it. Okay, in summary, the financial abuse is quite common. It's usually a close relative or friend that needs money, and they can justify it to themselves somehow or other. Demented people look normal. They look like they ought to be able to handle this. And we can do these simple tests to screen for impairment, but we aren't doing it. We don't recognize them, and we're not looking at the people that are at risk. So let's uh, open it up for questions and answers. I hope I have answers. I know you have questions. Here's a question uh, that just came in. My mother was financially exploited by a family member and left penniless at 93. Her trust and bank accounts were drained, but the perpetrator reactivated her very dormant credit cards by diverting her mail to his home in another state. One credit card company is being very difficult and claim it was completely legal for the perpetrator to access my mom's card and charge purchases for himself. He did coerce and use undue influence, and undue influence is a legal term, to change her legal documents and had a quote-unquote springing POA executed. However, the POA was never legally put into effect with two people declaring my mom incompetent. Is it true that you can defraud a senior legally when you have a POA? 
The perpetrator's wife also impersonated my mother to raise credit limits. Uh, I filed a police report when this happened two years ago. The DA told me everything was legal and declined the case. The total losses were over $500,000. Could you speak more about fiduciary abuse and why prosecutor why prosecutors don't investigate and charge family members with a crime? The undue influence term is key here. An undue influence means that they influenced the person to make a decision who wasn't qualified to make that decision. In other words, did not have decision-making capacity. And that is a crime, and that could be prosecuted. The prosecutors probably don't go after this because it's hard to prove. You have to have witnesses. Uh, it's very difficult to document. This case looks pretty clear that it ought to be able to be prosecuted, and I don't really have a reason about why prosecutors wouldn't investigate this, except perhaps their docket is so loaded with everything else that they can't come to terms with it. But clearly, this was a case of undue influence and outright theft when they uh, took over her bank account and credit cards. Another question, if the facility did an evaluation each morning that wasn't effective, how often would you recommend a more in-depth evaluation? For those of us who have elder family members living at home, okay, in our clinic, we have an elder senior clinic called UT Senior Health. My geriatricians routinely will perform a cognitive assessment on every single new patient, just as a baseline. So like you would for an EKG, where did we start out? Is this person cognitively intact or not? So that question is very pertinent, and I think everybody over 65 or everybody that is concerned about a memory loss ought to have that test done. And it's a simple screening test. And I'm not talking about just the Minicog. We also use the St. Louis University Mental Status Exam, which you can find online. Next question is, there one thing that should alert a family member that there is impairment of executive function? Disinhibition, you know, saying things that they ordinarily wouldn't say. Personality changes, uh, stubbornness, uh, anger management. These are all clues. We may say, oh, this is just sort of an exacerbation of his previous personality. But is it really? No. This is executive uh, dis disinhibition. Those are the clues that we need to be doing some testing on this patient. Often, uh, grandma will lose something and will suspect a granddaughter, for example, of stealing some jewelry. And she'll start hiding things like her money or her uh, wedding ring. And then she can't remember where she put them and will say, eh, you know, the granddaughter's stealing again. These are obviously clues. Here's another question. My mother was declared incapable of handling her affairs and, her medic and medications by her personal doctor before the family member took over her legal documents by having a springing POA drafted. I'm not sure what the question is. My mother was declared incapable of handling her affairs by her personal doctor before having a family member take over her legal documents. Now, that may be a, a question about when should we get a power of attorney? for our parents. And a power of attorney can be given voluntarily by a parent to manage the financial affairs, but the parent has to have the capacity to make that decision. So there are some shades of gray here. If you have very mild uh, dementia, you can still drive a car and find your way around and make it back to your house and be safe. But you may not be able to make complex financial decisions like uh, a big investment or making out your, your will. So what we do then is a trusted family member and the, the son or, the, or the, the parent ought to be able to make that decision about who is trusted. That's a much simpler decision to give that power of attorney. 
But people that have a power of attorney should be transparent about it and let other family members look at the transactions in the checkbook. When it gets to the point where we're looking at um, uh, abuse and then the law gets involved and we start looking at a uh, guardianship. In the case of my personal family, we uh, had to take a guardianship of my mother and my father. My father also was developing <laughs> some executive dysfunction. He was an ultra-conservative guy that grew up during the Depression. He was getting lots of letters and requests for donations, and anybody that sent a letter that had Ronald Reagan's name on it, he would send him a check. Fortunately, he was pretty tidy and only sent him 10 or $20. <laughs> but it was clearly inappropriate, and these were, a lot of these were not, uh, not at all uh, using the money as, a, as it was meant to be used. So we had to go to court and have cognitive testing done and have both of them declared uh, financially incompetent. We took financial guardianship and manage all their money after that. And we were able to save the greatest portion of their estate. Now the next question is, how do we learn about common scams? Is there a list to access? Uh, we are gonna have a website uh, that we'll refer you to that'll be uh, posted uh, after this talk. And I would recommend that you go there and take a look. You can also just Google uh, financial abuse of the elderly or financial scams the list is unending. These people are very bright and can just think of all sorts of innovative ways to take our money away from us. The next question is, if a physician noticed that someone is depressed, lonely, and impaired, do they warn families about care, to be careful about scams? They should. Our group, and I personally, do that. I'll sit down with the family member and say, Who's many, and this is one of the questions we ask our patients as a new patient, who manages your financial affairs? Now, I'm not prying, and we're pretty, uh, generally people are pretty private about their financial affairs, even with their children. You may not know what your parents' financial assets are. They may not tell you. How much money do you make? You know, we don't go up to people and say, how much money do you have? What's your net worth? Sort of like saying, how much do you weigh? We just don't do that, but we should, at least in this situation. And so we'll sit down with the family and say, Does, do you look at your father's checkbook? Is he paying his own bills? Is there someone that's looking over his shoulder? I would recommend that. And then we'll negotiate with the son or with the father or the parent to share some of that financial responsibility because this person is depressed or this person does have cognitive impairment. Let's watch out for the scammers. I've had parent patients who've had to change the mailing address <laughs> of their parents so that uh, they weren't getting all the scammer mail or change the phone number. It just is a common event. But do most physicians do this? Probably not. Is it better to call Adult Protective Services or the police if you suspect a scam? APS is understaffed. Adult Protective Services should be called and it should be reported. The police should be called in San Antonio. They are sensitive to this crime and they will investigate. APS may take them longer. Both should be notified. Uh, there aren't any further questions at this point, uh, so I'm going to sign off. I want to thank everybody for the uh, opportunity to address you about this, and I hope I get an opportunity to speak again. Thank you.